Hello children of a lesser joint and welcome to today's video. I want to share with you today one of my most prized possessions. I call it successful treatment and I put a question mark in the parentheses and diagnostic failure. When I was taught to treat temporomandibular joint disorders, I learned that the far majority of patients were going to have an occlusomuscular disorder. And I was taught to use an interocclusal device, a splint, an appliance, however you want to call it. And this could be used as both a treatment modality and a diagnostic separator that, in fact, if the patient had responded to treatment, uh, this would have been considered a success. The appliance does not address root cause. And now I have to seriously question whether or not this is diagnostic at all, even though I've made improvements in the patient's pain. So an appliance might be a form of symptomatic care in its ability to provide relief for some people, but I'm going to show you that it's not diagnostic as to the cause. So I'm going to show you this patient. He was complaining of left joint pain. This is a 42-year-old male who is in the computer industry working for one of the top financial houses on Wall Street in their IT department. And his left joint, when I take the MRI on what's called the T1 image over here, looks absolutely normal. As a matter of fact, I use this MRI to show what a normal joint should look like. You can see I've outlined the disc over here in the white dotted area, but I think you can probably see it better if I outline it, it's got a beautiful bow tie type configuration, as we would call it. The condyle is well positioned, and yet this patient has pain. If I go to what's called the T2 weighted image, which tells me a little bit about hydrogen protons and, and water, we can see that back here, right in front of the ear, which is over here, the patient has an effusion, and now I'm wondering what is causing that, and he also complains, notice here, of ear pain as one of his presenting symptoms. He's able to open to a reasonable amount, uh, considered normal, certainly uh, within the normal range at 47 millimeters, and at the time that I did this particular study, I wasn't quite as far along as I am today. So let me show you what the crime scene looks like and what happens in this particular case. I ultimately made the patient better. Up over here, you can see in the top left, I started splint therapy. He did extremely well. I was able to make improvements in both his pain and his range of motion, going from 47 millimeters to an interincisal distance of 57 millimeters. But as his life deteriorated and his symptoms deepened, he became depressed. He was under the care of a psychiatrist. He became unemployed and had a collect disability. He was placed on a serotonin derivative. He had GERD, which means he had gastric reflux. He was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue sy syndrome, orthostatic hypertension, and he had pain in his cervical area, his shoulder area, his upper body quarter, wrists, knees, ankles, elbow, and additionally, he developed sciatica pain. He had been tested by a rheumatologist, and he was 
seronegative, but he also developed prostatitis. And so here I have this individual who has a rather obsessive kind of personality, and he was doing research like crazy, coming from this engineering background, and I have to tell you, very much like a lot of what I've seen the patients do on the different group sites or those that come into my practice, they're trying to figure out, is this an ergonomic problem? He's sitting by a computer all day. He works extremely long and hard hours. He's always under the gun. And he's thinking, my goodness, how has my life done this to me? And so here we see this complex of pain in muscle joints, his gut. We see the psychological component, the urogenital symptoms, skeletal issues with bone pain, fatigue, lower back pain, and he's got these vascular phenomenon going on where I'm able to press on certain blood vessels and elicit the pain. Yet, in 2013, when I'm way down the road, he's doing extremely better. I'm wondering what's going on over here. How did this happen? And so I sat down with him and I said, you know, how would you like to reconstruct your story? And now I take out my questionnaire, which is 17 pages long, and we went over that from head to toe. And then I said, how would you like to run some blood tests and see if we can figure this out? And he said, sure, let's do that. I specifically asked him if he had an STD, and he said no. So as it turns out, here's what ultimately happened. I found out that he had a genetic defect, which could be described by thrombophilia, one of them called the MTHFR gene mutation. Now, this is one of the two worst mutations you can have. This is called a homozygous C67T mutation. Notice how the allele appears twice. Um, the worst of the lot would be the C677T as a heterozygous in combination with an A1298C. He also had an area where he puts him in a hypofibrinolytic pathway, a little bit beyond what many of you as lay people might presume. But the big story here is that he had chlamydia and he had a past infection. So what is it that happened over here? Here I made improvements, or at least I thought I did with my splint. He ends up seeing his physician. He never actually told me about the symptoms that he had, nor did I ask. I wasn't astute enough. And here's a man who ended up having his life trashed because it wasn't originally diagnosed as a sexually transmitted disease. He falls within the category of a reactive arteritis. Notice he also had H. pylori, which was effectively treated. But in the trafficking of the diagnosis, at the end of the day, I found that he had an inflammatory issue behind the jaw joint in front of the ear. And rather than make him a splint, if I would have been capable at the time of performing a differential diagnosis at the level that I'm capable of doing it today, I would have had him go on an antibiotic. I would have let his physician treat him based on the positive study for chlamydia. And it's highly unlikely that a splint would have been necessary at all. So here's a case 
where I made the improvements and it turned out that I didn't have to treat him like this at all. The bottom line within this story is very simple. The splint does not give you a differential diagnosis. The splint may be capable in certain patients of providing palliative care. Very much the same as taking a Tylenol or a leave or an aspirin for a headache. It doesn't tell you what's wrong with you but at times it's capable of getting you out of pain. Just to put the symptoms up there of a reactive arthritis, it includes issues related to the stomach and bowel, your genital, it can include manifestations in the eye like conjunctivitis and iritis, it includes, in the center over here, arthritis and joint pain and can be highly destructive if not caught early. It has cutaneous manifestations, often affecting the skin and nails. It can be an issue related to difficulties with fertility. It affects tendons, ligaments, muscles, and bone, as well as kidney and heart. However, over 50% of the population that has a chlamydia STD can be grossly asymptomatic in almost all of the categories. So here is a lesson well learned. I hope that you will understand why I presented this particular case. It's because we consider splints to be a form of a benchmark which doesn't really exist. Thank you. And I hope you'll join me for my next video when I'll be rocking it out with Jaw Talk.